So this is Frank Scaturo and you are watching Pavlina's Kids Place. Hey everyone, it's Pavlina from Pavlina's Kids Place and we're here in New York City and I'm here with Frank Scaturo. How are you doing? Hi Pavlina, great to see you. How are you doing today? It's good to see you again. Like it's right been a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, so we first we last talked actually at the Grand Tomb. Can you just tell that's me right. about how that's doing and everything about that? Well, uh, we just had the 150th anniversary of Lee's surrender to Grant this year, so we had a nice a commemoration for that event. Uh, we, we did an anniversary dinner over at the uh, Union League Club, and we're talking with National Park Service representatives and with some supporters and architects who are helping us out about how we could improve visitor services, visitor facilities, and also expand the hours at the monument. That's amazing. I remember when I went a couple years ago, it was it was awesome. And like you obviously gave a great interview. It was it was great. So we just went on an amazing tour that you guided. Tell me about some of the amazing um, you know monuments that we hit. Yes. Well, New York City. A lot of people don't realize was the, our first national capital under the Constitution. Constitution was uh, the product of a convention that occurred in Philadelphia, but it was here that George Washington was inaugurated president under the Constitution, 1789. It's here that we had our first Congress. So among the sites that we saw were that first Capitol, Federal Hall, uh, where Washington was sworn in April 30th, 1789. We also saw one of the two sites uh, of Washington's executive mansion where he lived from February 23rd to the end of August 1790. Uh, one of the interesting things about these sites, of course, is that most of them, the vast majority of them, no longer exist and a lot of them don't even have a marker to indicate their significance. So, for instance, the George Washington executive mansion site is now a Duane Reed and there's nothing but a bronze plaque to really indicate what it was. Uh, just a stone's throw away was Bowling Green Park, uh, right above, uh, right north of Battery Park, which used to be the southern tip of Manhattan before the landfill. Well, President Washington would walk that area on a regular basis. Uh, a few years before the revolution began, uh, Bowling Green was a very popular park. It was developed as a residential area. And on July 9th of 1776, there was a public reading of the Declaration of Independence that occurred right here where we're standing at what was then known as the Commons, today it's City Hall Park. And once the Declaration was read, the crowd of people that heard the Declaration charged down Broadway to Bowling Green. And there, the middle of Bowling Green Park, was a gilded lead statue of King George III. And this crowd tore down the statue and they had it melted into about 42,000 musket balls for the Continental Army. Uh, so yeah, if you go there today, we still have Bowling Green Park. Uh, there's a, a fountain roughly marking the spot where the George III statue was. Uh, we saw the probable birthplace of John Jay, which is right across the street from the original City Hall uh, in New York, which went back to uh, the Dutch colonial days. Uh, we saw the home of Alexander Hamilton, the site of the home of Alexander Hamilton on Wall Street, as well as his Bank of New York, and then right next door, uh, t today it's next door, back then it was just, uh, just a few numbers away, the Bank of Manhattan company that his arch nemesis Aaron Burr uh, had founded. Uh, we also saw the Merchant's Coffee House site, which is on the southeast corner of Water and Wall Street. Uh, the Merchant's Coffee House was where New York's Committee of Correspondents met soon after the British passed the Intolerable Acts, and that was a series of oppressive measures following the Boston Tea Party of December 1773. And this meeting that took place in May of 74 at the Merchant's Coffee House by the Committee of Correspondents directly led to the establishment of the First Continental Congress, because the New York Committee of Correspondents said, you know what? We can't just have one colony expressing their opposition to the British. We need to assemble all the colonies together to go against and tell the adversaries of liberty that things have to uh, change. And that's where, that's how uh, the progression of events had, uh, had proceeded, had taken place that uh, many people say were really uh, integral to the independence movement. And of course, that's 1774. The first shots of the Revolutionary War fired in 1775. And the following year, 
1776, George Washington comes to New York after successfully fending off the British in Boston. He realizes this is their next target. So we saw again near Bowling Green Park, uh, one, number one Broadway, uh, the headquarters of General Israel Putnam of the Continental Army was where George Washington would uh, address his troops for that period in 1776 when the Continental Army uh, was here. That is so cool, and it was it was a great you know tour and everything. I really enjoyed it. So, like you were kind of saying, a lot of these you know monuments or places are not even marked with like certain placards, and if they are, it's like people just walk by it. Like I've I've kind of explored this area, and I haven't even noticed half of them. So yeah. why is that? And like, do you think there would be a way to get more placards up or anything like that? Yes. Well, New York's focus from the beginning has been so much on building something bigger and better. Let's tear down what's there today and construct something uh, something new tomorrow. This f focus is so much on the future that unfortunately there's a precious part of our past that we allowed to be torn down. Now, as we were walking, there were two original buildings that still stood in the New York of Washington's day, which basically ran from the Commons, or City Hall Park where we are now, down to Bowling Green. Uh, and that is the Francis Tavern, which is still open as a museum and St. Paul's Chapel is just a couple blocks down from where we are now. Uh, when that, by the way, is an amazing site because it was consecrated in 1766 and when George Washington returned triumphantly in 1783 after the British evacuated New York, which they occupied for seven years of the Revolution, Washington came right here down Broadway past St. Paul's Chapel. Uh, the chapel had survived a devastating fire in September of 1776 and it also survived 9-11 because this church was in the shadow of the Twin towers. But besides those two buildings, we really, as you said, all we have are occasionally there's a, a, a bronze tablet of, or a marker of some kind, but most of the sites don't even have that. Um, Federal Hall, our first capital, there is a sub-treasury building that goes back to the 19th century that is there and it's operated as a museum to commemorate that period, but we have nothing for most of these other sites that I've mentioned to you. So what I think we really need to do and what I'm hoping we can you know, sort of get the ball rolling is to have these sites commemorated, have them properly marked, properly designated, and promoted in a way that compares to the Freedom Trail in Boston and the independence sites in Philly. Now, although we don't have nearly as many of those buildings that are preserved from from the original buildings, there is still so much important history that happened here. I think there must be a way to promote it. And you know what? I think it would make a lot of sense to to look toward a reconstruction or of one or two of these really significant structures. Imagine, for instance, if no knock on Dwayne Reed, we all often find, you know, yeah. go there shopping for whatever reason, but uh, what would be better to have there, you know, a, a Dwayne Reed or a replica of George Washington's executive mansion that could actually serve as a museum of what essentially was the early White House. St. Paul's Chapel, you were saying that, you know, it kind of, it survived 9-11. You were also saying that they had like a bunch of um, memorabilia, memorabilia kind of stuff in there. Can you just tell me about like what 9-11 things that they have in St. Paul's Chapel? Sure. Well, immediately after 9-11, St. Paul's Chapel was a place where first responders really had a respite. It was where they would go uh, during their work to take a break, to pray, and, and then to commemorate their comrades uh, who had fallen, uh, who had given their lives during the rescue attempts and then the recovery attempts that followed 9-11. So immediately after this horrible attack, uh, you could see all over St. Paul's Chapel uh, relics of, of equipment, uh, pieces of uniforms from firefighters and police officers who were here on the scene and as well as other uh, recovery workers. The chapel became a makeshift memorial for not only the first responders but ultimately for 9-11 victims and if you go in there to this day you won't see you know, that the fence outside the chapel is is no longer has the, the uh, material, the uniform uh, pieces and the memorials that were put up. 
But inside uh, the church, you will find several memorials, uh, several of these artifacts from 9-11, and, and a good number of memorials that family members put up with pictures that they have put next to some of the candles uh, of their loved ones who were lost on 9-11. Yeah, I think that's absolutely amazing because it's right next to the 9-11 memorial now, but it's also, it was like right, right. there. In, in fact, when you go in the church, you'll find these you, these two huge, huge, hugely important periods of history. There's 9-11 in recent times, but then as you walk through the church, you'll go past George Washington's pew, which uh, is right below one of the earliest depictions of the Great Seal of the United States, painting of this very early painting of the eagle symbol. And then across uh, the way, also inside the church, is the governor's pew, where Governor George Clinton and later John Jay, that's where they worshipped. And so you have this, uh, these, these very visible signs of the revolution right there next to this 9-11 memorial. So you are writing a book. Can you tell me about your latest book? Yes, thanks. I, I'm writing a, a short book uh, called George Washington's New York, at least that's the working title, and it is going to explore uh, all of these sites that were important from the revolutionary and the early capital period uh, back in George Washington's day. Uh, and it will cover all five boroughs of New York City. Of course, the walking tour today, we could only, of course, uh, walk a limited stretch of territory, which was the, the hub of the New York of Washington's time. But uh, the nice thing about books is you are not limited by geography, and so we're able to uh, go into all five boroughs, what they have. There are some significant historic houses uh, in Upper Manhattan, the Morris Jamel Mansion, for instance. There's the Van Cortland mansion in the Bronx. There are some sites, well I, I will say the old stone house from the Battle of Brooklyn or otherwise known as the Battle of Long Island. A number of markers, but generally not more than markers, commemorating the Battle of Long Island. Uh, that's all over Brooklyn. Staten Island has uh, several structures actually from the revolutionary period that still survive. And then there are uh, there are various redoubts, uh, defense works that were put up around New York City that are, I, I think, important to note, so I'll be flagging those as well. Thank you so much for talking to me. Well, thank you, Pavlin. It's great being with you again.